Welcome everyone. Yeah, and we're so, so glad you joined today's webinar, Navigating Reimbursement for Virtual First Care. My name is Abby and I lead healthcare and public health programs here at DIME, including our impact initiative. Today, we'll be talking about the new payment encoding toolkit and hear from our panel of experts about the current coding landscape and the opportunities that lie ahead. Just a couple of points of housekeeping information before we get started. First, please note that today's session is being recorded and the recording and slides will be available on DIME's website after the event. Next, there will be an opportunity for Q&A with our panelists at the end of the session. To ask a question for discussion, please type it into the Q&A box. And lastly, we just ask that people not transcribe the webinar. As I mentioned, I lead our impact initiative. If you're not familiar with this community, it is a group of leading organizations from across the healthcare industry, which you can see highlighted on this slide. Our members come together with the shared focus of advancing high quality virtual first care and addressing some of the greatest challenges facing the industry, including access, cost, and equity. Today's event marks the launch of Impact's newest toolkit on payment encoding, which Katie will provide the link to in the chat. This toolkit includes a variety of resources from fundamental information on the basics of billing and coding to a comprehensive coding library and step-by-step -step guide for checking claims in accordance with industry best practices. As I'm sure you're aware, reimbursement is a critical topic across the industry, and our impact group wanted to create this toolkit to help users navigate successful reimbursement strategies to continue to make this new modality of care more accessible. I'm so excited to welcome our panelists today, but before I introduce them, I have the honor of welcoming IMPACT's co-founder and chair of Cardiff Ocean Group, Don Jones, for opening remarks. Welcome, everybody, uh, to, a, to a fantastic topic, reimbursement, getting paid for what we do. Uh, frankly, it's probably the number one topic I see in all the companies I work with, and I've worked with, uh, uh, I think to date now, close to 100 different companies in one way or another having to deal with medical, uh, medical reimbursement. Uh, over my career, I've managed over 40,000 physicians. I've formed and managed over two dozen medical groups. So that's the background of uh, what I'll, some of my commentary here this morning going, going into, um, into the session with our, with our other experts. We're, reimbursement is based on coding, and coding really is one way of trying to determine the fair value for our services, or perhaps it's more about the fair value for knowing what to do. And in fact, it's both. Um, and if you think about it, you'll understand um, that um, a lot of what a physician does is um, is make analyze all the information and then make a recommendation of what to do next, as opposed to necessarily doing a procedure, but both can get paid for. Historically, accountants and lawyers decided to charge for their time based on hours spent, a very simple metric. The physician community went down a different path. They decided to code everything. There's reasons for it, government policy. Lucia has a great uh, deal of, of history on this, but we went through a completely different process with physicians where we kind of code everything they do and add all of those up and uh, turn that into a reimbursable events, maybe with, a, maybe with many different uh, codes attached to them. But in reality, reimbursement actually it comes in many flavors. It comes in fee for service. It can come in membership payments. It can come in bundled payments, come in cost plus uh, contracts, and it can come in capitation, not all of which require coding. But coding is often the most common way of keeping track of what work was done, who did the work. And effectively, it's an effective accounting system for keeping track of all of the different things that possibly could be done and who did them. Interestingly enough, you don't need the codes to get paid, and almost half of the medical groups I uh, have been involved with don't make active use of coding to, in order to get reimbursement. Um, some of them were based on membership fees. Some of them were based on capitation. 
for those of you who haven't started thinking about capitation in your models, it's been going on for 45 years, especially in California. Some medical groups, multi-specialty groups are fully capitated. Some could say global capitation, get paid for hospitalization, pharmaceutical costs, and also all medical specialties. Lots of very, very, very flavors. Whether they use coding or not as a form of keeping track is really an accounting function in that case, not so much a reimbursement function. So coding is also used for provider productivity and compensation for keeping track of who's more productive than the next guy or gal that's out there. And an important part of in part of that. It's also for used for ranking the complexity of the work being performed and having an understanding about that complexity. All this amounts to the fact that just because you have a code doesn't mean you're going to get paid. Uh, there's a whole nother amount of steps that come about uh, in terms of making sure you're actually going to get reimbursement for all of your good work. So virtual first care must show value to re receive fair compensation. Codes are just one component of showing that value. And it's an important front door to get successful payment and reimbursement for all of your good work. But I'm here welcoming you to this uh, to this event today and all the good work that was put into coming up with the, uh, the set of recommendations and, and processes that have gone into this. But I want you to understand it's one component of what's actually a much longer journey and making sure you get fair compensation for the work you actually perform. Thank you very much for inviting me, Abby, to uh, op open the event and uh, I'll stay and be available at the end for questions. Abby, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you, Don. That was wonderfully said, and I will follow it by formally introducing our panel to continue the conversation. Starting with Dr. Zeke Silva, practicing radiologist and current chair of the American Medical Association's Relative Value Scale Update Committee, also known as the RUC. Lucia Savage, Chief Privacy and Regulatory Officer for Amada Health, and seasoned leader and thought expert in data privacy, cybersecurity, and health IT. And Dr. Ryan Vega, physician residence at DIME and former chief innovation officer for the Office of Healthcare Innovation and Learning at the Veterans Health Administration. We are so thrilled to have you all here today. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Ryan Vega. Thanks, Abby, and, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have the privilege of moderating, in essence, this panel, because I can promise you both Lucia and Dr. Silva have an immense amount of knowledge and experience that that I you all will want to hear from. And every time I talk to them, I learn something. To provide some context in the way that we think about the conversation we're about to have, I want you to imagine a patient uh, as well as a provider, as well as uh, the payer. And think about an individual who's navigating chronic disease management, let's say diabetes, or even something a little bit more acute. Let's say uh, they're dealing with Crohn's disease. And they're enrolled in a program that is predominantly using digital health, digital uh, types of engagement, whether that's through virtual, or whether that's through text or web-based, or even text messaging. And they're engaging with multiple different practitioners, not just with physicians, but it could be with coaches, who it could be with nursing staff or social workers, and sort of a broad array of a team that we all sort of imagine provides a really good patient-centric experience, but we know isn't the way that we think about the way that the regulations or the payments are structured. And so as we imagine that patient on the journey or as a qualified health professional or even sort of someone from the payment side saying, how do we make all this work? Uh, what I want you to think about is keep centered from that position. And so Lucia, I'll, I'll ask you just sort of briefly, as you think about both your experience and sort of the work that you do and think about where we stand today uh, in the and the idea of having care be more predominantly utilizing virtual first, where do you see both the, the unique challenges and opportunities uh, in today's market? You know, Ryan, that's a great question. And I was listening to you and I was flashing on, we all have the text threads, right? Like the six people that you're constantly texting with, it could be your family text thread or your best besties. And you're like, you can quickly scroll through, see what all the other texts were, and then weigh in with what you think. I'm like, yeah, why don't we have care team text threads in healthcare, right? That's, I think that would be like so patient centric, especially 
literally SMS, not web-based messaging, be because in the underserved, we have a broadband problem. But putting that aside, but you've got this care happening through this multifaceted team-based communication, but the people who are professionals need to get paid for that care. That's a very legitimate thing. As Don said, it's about knowing what to do for the patient at the right point in time with the right expertise. And the physician's expertise is different from the social worker's expertise. They need to work together. How do you how do you do that in a fair way? And I think that that was the intellectual and business challenge that I've really been focused on for Amada as we grow our um, care team based diabetes care, but thinking more more large scale about the system as a whole. Um, and so I really was kind of one of the people went to Dime and I'm like, we really have to get farther into this conversation. Um, so I'm happy to have this conversation today. And then the last thing I would say before I'm seeing what, what Zeke has to say is, I wanna add one more thing into the hopper that Don was talking about. Yes, uh, coding is used for productivity. Coding is used to sort of um, keep track of who did what, but also coding, coded claims drive the analytics engine that comes out of healthcare with a healthcare exhaust. So. I learned this, uh, cut my milk teeth on it in the aughts, learning about HEDIS measures for medical groups in California, where we were measuring with claims data, how frequently physicians were uh, ordering mammograms for women in scope for a mammogram test, because we had uh, low rates of mammogram te uh, test compliance. That particular problem is much better, but that's a really great example. Count the women, count the number of orders, that's all in the claims data, come up with a mathematical score, et cetera. And so we also have to think about this text-based, team-based care that's patient-centric and how do we analyze whether it's working, whether it's working the same, but with a different modality, is it better? Is it better outcomes? Is it just same outcome, but lower cost? That's also good. Um, is it worse? We can only do that when we have data that lets us compare the new modality of care to the old modality, the traditional modality of care. Um, and that happens through claims data. Yeah. Ryan, this, yeah, this is Zeke. I, I wanna add that, that comment at the end, I think was so important and I'm gonna repeat it. And, and paraphrase it in a different way. And we're we're talking about innovation here. We're, we're talking about changing patterns of care in a way that, that many of us on this call believe is the right thing to do. Perhaps that's through observation, it's through data. In many cases, it's through personal experience. And as we think about innovation and we think about how we describe and capture innovation, but importantly, how we compare innovation in many ways, that's where the AMA and current procedural terminology have a role that's often perhaps recognized but often underlooked. And if you're going to change payment paradigms, you're going to change clinical direction and potentially change patient outcomes, you want to compare the new to the old. And to do that, almost by definition, you have to have a consistent nomenclature to describe what was done sort of in contemporaneously and sort of real time but also what was done previously compared to current. And that's what we really work particularly hard at the AMA with current procedural terminology is to ensure that CPT codes describe what physicians and other professionals, what they do. And as we look at those CPT codes, I think it's relevant to describe them within the context of the innovation cycle. Because the, the current procedural terminology editorial panel, when we look at a new service and we look at a new code, we look at something innovative, there's a few parameters that go into the decision-making whether a code is created. For example, is there literature support and what's the strength of that literature? Is it FDA approved? And then perhaps one of the ones that's or parameters or metrics that's most influential for innovation is, is it widely performed? So the response an innovator might, might make to that last metric is, well, I need a code to become widely performed and it can't become widely performed until I have a code. So you have this sort of innovation cycle. And it's, it's, it's perhaps a limitation, but it's also perhaps a credit in that we're looking to get innovation responsibly. We're not creating codes for services that are not proven, but we're enabling services that may be proven. And getting back to your example, Ryan, exactly what you described. I mean, CPT has been around you know, 50 plus years. 
The RUP, the Resource-Based Relative Value Scale, which my committee helps maintain, has been around for over 30 years. And when you think about how much medicine is innovated during those respective periods of time, it comes with a very real responsibility for us collectively as a team to make sure that that reflects accurately what, what we're doing. Thank you. You And you all touched on this, and even John uh, Don mentioned some of this in the opening, and it sort of begs the question, and, and Lucia kind of gave us a teaser to the answer, but why does it matter that virtual first companies submit claims? I mean, why, why can't they just invoice, right? And then you, you think about, well, what impact does that have to the evidence? Not just in deciding how to reimburse, but in, in evaluating the quality. So I'm interested from both your perspectives, You know, why does it matter that we try to find more structured ways of being able to do this? And then how do we, to Zeke's point, innovate on top of that cycle to evolve sort of the way that it may be a, a qualified or non-qualified health practitioner can get reimbursement? I think there's, I'm just going to give a couple of examples. So in the diabetes space, for example, and, and the measure is changing, but let's just stick with hemoglobin A1C uh, as a measure of glucose control in HEDIS, right? So this is something that the government is looking at for the performance of Medicare Advantage plans. Large employers are looking for for the performance of their health plans. And state regulators are also looking at for the performance of those licensed health plans. So pretty key uh, core part of the healthcare system. Uh, if you're looking for whether blood sugar has been controlled and you have a program like Omada happening on the side, and maybe it's not contracted as a provider and there are no claims, but they're successfully actually both helping the individual keep their glucose controlled and reminding the individual to go get their lab stick every quarter. Nobody likes that, but it's the gold standard. Then you, how do you know to look for it? It's you're not you're are you going to go through the invoices? I mean, AI is pretty good, but it's not nearly as powerful as the claims data engines. So that's sort of one example. Another example is for uh, a large customer who wants to make these kinds of services available because it has a dispersed workforce, or maybe it's taking advantage of, you know, these new flexibilities for telehealth, right? They just want to include this in their medical claims. They want to include it in their normal medical budget. They don't want to manage it separately. If there's no claim, they can't do that. It becomes a whole separate operational process for them to figure out where the invoice is going to get sent and who's in charge of paying the invoice and how do you reconcile the invoice and prove that the invoice is accurate, whereas claims, all of that is kind of built into the system. So those are two examples. Um, I know it's not the best uh, metaphor, but the thing that keeps coming up in my mind is if we think way back in our way back time machine, when the RUC was established, we also were establishing ambulatory surgery centers. And those were like a new way to deliver surgery that historically had been delivered in a hospital and required an overnight stay, right? We have a new modality of care here, but we need to, when it's clinically uh, valid care, treat it the same way. So that's the long the long game for me. Zeke, what about you? Yeah, the, I agree with, the, with those comments. And, and when we talk about coding, you know, quote unquote, and at the highest, most general level, it's certainly CPT coding, but it's everything, you know, many of the examples that Lucia just described, even in the outpatient prospective payment system, you have a whole different set of, of ambulatory classifications for outpatient care, you know, DRG codes, you have risk stratification codes, you have PQRI or PQRS quality category two codes. I mean, you could go on and do an individual webinar, every one of those families. But I think the high level point that, that we, we view at the AMA from a CPT perspective that, that I've I said earlier, but I'll repeat now is having that consistent nomenclature is important at multiple levels. And I love the way Don framed it because it's not just billing. It's not necessarily just payment. It's not even just compliance. But what it is, is CPT, if we do it right, which I think right. we do and we strive to do, has other applications. It's involved in the consistent nomenclature for health policy resource determination. To Don's example about productivity or performance of physicians and professionals, it's epidemiology, it's resource tracking, it's a value-based care. We're actually, by, by coincidence, the AMA, we're doing a webinar tomorrow. I think it's at noon on the East Coast talking about the role of CPT and value-based care because we don't live in a vacuum. You know, 30 years ago, fee-for-service, when RBRBS was created, was the me mechanism and the means to be paid within the Medicare program. 
And for sometimes justified, sometimes unjustified reasons, fee services subject to criticism. At the end of the day, it allows physicians to report what they do, when they do it, and how they do it to some degree. But there's also the potential overutilization. There was a period of time when quality perhaps wasn't as integrated as it is now and perhaps should have been. But again, the AMA, we don't live in a vacuum. We recognize that this evolution is taking place. Global cap uh, capitation was an example Don used. And we realize that CPT's role, at least in those models, maybe is not just less or different, but, it, but, it's, but it's evolving. And we hope that by creating a consistent system, that it allows meaningful comparison and meaningful application of the metrics, which I just described. And I, I think you both eloquently touched upon both the value and really the necessity. It's 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 infrastructure, right? So it's sort of, you know, I'm from Louisiana and from New Orleans, and we, we put pylons in the ground before you lay a foundation because the land sinks. I mean, you you've got to have the, the the pylons in the ground, the infrastructure, if you're going to maintain this system over time. What becomes really interesting, uh, and and I think you all both bring difference of opinions, uh, sorry, difference of perspective here, which are important, but how do you then account for non-qualified health professionals, particularly those, we know that they're integral to the care model, but and the outcomes sort of are starting to prove that, but, but the codes require qualified health practitioners. So from both the regulatory and the payment, uh, Zeke, you know, turning to you quickly, how, how do you sort of think about this from both the, the RUC perspective and as a provider's perspective? Yeah, it's an important question. So we think about, you know, sort of physicians are physicians, you know, qualified health professionals, think of nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, falling within that sort of Medicare definition. But then you've got a whole host of other health you know, professionals that are involved in the healthcare team, you know, nurses, speech pathology, physical therapy, and on and on. And every one of those Professions makes a valuable contribution to patient care, and it's a it's a team effort. It's what was described by by Lucia early and by your example Ryan early on. So, from a purely coding fee per service perspective, how do we capture that? Well, from our perspective at the AMA, when we create a new CPT code, we create that code to describe certainly physician work, but we also describe what's what's called practice expense. What would the co what cost would a physician incur? if they provide that service in the office setting. And it's staff equipment supplies. So the staff is how much time for the RN, how much time for the CT technologist, how much uh, supplies from how many gloves, how many needles, how about the equipment? What about power tables and lights? And we're very granular to ensure that those recommendations capture the important activities of those individuals. And you translate back into the hospital setting where it's a bit different, the, the payment systems are different you think about the um, inpatient prospective payment system where it's more cost reporting by the hospitals and what are their, their, their costs, what are their expenses in those cost reports. It gets super wonky, but they inform geometric means, which inform ambulatory payment classifications, which ultimately inform payment. But at the end of the day, and this is a very important point that, that I really wish to stress is it's our responsibility as, as professionals at every level. And I say this to my, my financial experts, my accountants, and I say this as well to, to, to hospital staff and, and physicians is we really have a responsibility to accurately report what we're doing and what those costs are and how, and, and how we're doing it to ensure that those resources are recognized because this is a dynamic system. We're talking about innovation and we want that innovation to occur both responsibly, but also robustly to ensure that services can uh, be supported in that innovation cycle. Lucia? Yeah, so two things I want to just briefly mention. It's in the toolkit, sort of the story of the DPP code for virtual DPP, which we obtained in 20, uh, effective 2018 and was renewed in 2021. We, we had to meet the criteria that Zeke talked about before of is there literature substantiating that this was a relevant and valid clinical protocol and not just some cheesy wellness app? Um, and secondly, like what prove how how the service was being performed and not just by Omada. And we actually did that in partnership with the AMA itself, who at one point in the past was in fact an Omada customer, but also with other diabetes prevention programs like the YMCA. And it was kind of a joint effort over a couple of years. Now, when we went to Renew, I was startled by how many other people were using this code. I knew how much we were using it and it was great and it was validating, but it is a category three code. And when we get to the end of that, five years, we're going to have to 
figure out what we're doing. Um, and maybe the system will have evolved. But the other thing I wanted to talk about was this idea about practice expense. And I really hope that that's like kind of the next stage of this conversation. One of the things that's emerged over the last few months as Zeke and I and, and others have been talking is like, okay, how does an audit log work in digital health, right? And I was actually just writing this yesterday in my CMS fee schedule letter. Like, We can tell to the 10th of a minute who was doing what in the, in the I'm going to say app in air quotes, uh, but the, the total structure um, across the entire care team, kind of in a way that's pretty difficult. If you think back to that text-based um, scenario that, that Ryan teed up and it's happening in a, a structure we control, not on your just phone as SMS, we know how long it took one practitioner to write their message, how long they spent looking at our EHR before they wrote the message, all the way through the food chain. How do we take the knowledge of what a digital, a fully digitized system can tell us about the nature of the care, the intensity of the care, the level of sophisticated education that's needed to supply that care, which is sort of across the entire care team? How do we take that and bring that into the same kind of analysis that Zeke was talking about, about how many uh, you know, lancets did you use? How many bandages did you use? You know, how much does it cost to have this piece of testing equipment in your office? How long you're amortizing that capital, et cetera, et cetera. We can do the same methodology, but we're looking at a different um, supply system, supply infrastructure. And I think that's really kind of part of what the next conversation needs to be. Yeah. Lucia, I want to just yeah, sorry, go ahead. Just quick please. response, because that's such an important point is, yeah, the methodology we're talking about from a practice expense perspective is 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 somewhat driven by time. So imagine an RN's time is worth you know X number of dollars per minute. And we look and we try to determine for this particular service how much time is that professional spending on that service. And so to, to Lucia's important point is, yeah, the more accurate we can be about capturing that time and the more sort of defensible we can be when this gets to higher level policymakers and payment determiners is, is relevant. And again, that's the nature of, we're talking innovation in clinical care, but that's the nature of us innovating within our maintenance and recommendations regarding RBU amounts and the RBRBS itself. And really wel welcome that opportunity to do so. We both made a really important point, and just Lucia, I'll dive a little bit and push a little bit deeper into now that we're seeing more of an omni channel approach, now that we're seeing more patients use both brick and mortar and virtual, how do you begin to account for what feels like almost two growing desperate systems? But we're going to have to find a way to integrate them. Uh, and, and to that integration, it, it is 30 minutes uh, in a virtual visit the same as 30 minutes in an office? Uh, does it depend on who it is? So I'm, I'm sort of interested in diving a little bit more into that because I think this is sort of the, the next challenge we'll face, but yeah. equally important as the conversation evolves. Definitely. We're all about integrating. That's why I've really been pushing to have this conversation. But I guess, you know, I became a student of and an advocate for outcomes-based, value-based care many, many years ago, back to that first HEDIS example that I gave a little while ago. And so what I see, the convergence I'm looking for is uh, integration of the new modality and understanding that delivery mechanism and that delivery infrastructure into regular healthcare, but at the same time, leveraging that to get to the next phase of paying for value. So for example, and this is just an OMADA example, but um, as technology evolves, more and more of these examples will come to life. But, you know, we can, uh, we know if a person's uh, managing their glucose because they're scanning their CGM with Omara, whether they're getting a lab stick or not, right? If we want the glucose controlled, that's the outcome we want. We know the outcome in real time. Um, you know, on the, on the, in the case of, you know, orthopedics, how do we use the gyroscope in your phone to help understand the impact of orthopedic surgery or physical therapy for that matter, you know, non-surgery. So I think that there's a few steps in the next phase, but that's my hope is that, you know, integration will get us to um, uh, ensure that we have the data to analyze what's going 
on, but start to change the the um, change the way we think about data so that it's less, oh, it's coding, it is fee for service, like it's almost definitionally predicted and now it's coded, but you could code something that is about outcome and pay for the outcome because you have this data about the intensity and the time, but also what happened when that service was supplied. Yeah, those are, thanks, Lisa. Those, those are great examples. You know, and we think about Ryan, kind of that evolution, or at least that integration of sort of brick and mortar care with, with, with hybrid care and, and where we are in that spectrum. You know, the American Medical Association, you know, full disclosure, I mean, I'm, I'm a doctor, I represent doctors. And so I believe in the doctor and the physician's role in that decision-making. Again, patients, patient family, patient needs are equally important. And that is a team-making by directional decision making, but you know, we looked at this from a physician perspective, and this goes back probably 2016. And, and we knew these technologies were evolving as quickly as they were. They knew we knew, or at least perceived, the benefits that they could bring. But what we also knew is that physicians were asking a lot of questions. You know, physicians were hearing different pieces of information and were looking for some consistency and some guidance from the AMA. Um, around early 2017, we created the Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group to look, we started with coding gaps, but we looked at a lot of different potential avenues for improvement in this space. But our approach was relatively simple. We just looked from a physician perspective and said, you know, does it work? You know, will I get paid? You know, will I get sued? And you know, will it work in my particular practice situation, which is, is heterogeneous by definition? And we worked along that tree to inform those decisions. And, and I think it's been good for us at the AMA because it's been pretty foundational for us. Number one, really helped when the public health emergency shut clinics down and we had no choice but to switch to virtual first care and sort of digital health payment models. But it also was very helpful for us, or it is helpful for us in the current space when I'm on a discussion like this, you know, we feel like we've taken steps to inform the physician perspective Again, recommending that that's one piece in the broader decision-making process. Can I just add one well, thing? It, just one thing. I want to just double click on what Zeke said about does it work? So that's where Digital Medicine Society and, and the clinical robustness with which the virtual care uh, protocol is developed and deployed really matters. And um, I talk all the time about cheesy wellness apps and we're not one of those and there are plenty out there thousands and thousands of them that are selling something that may or may not work. They don't have evidence behind them. They're not doing um, methodologically standard studies of ROI or uh, in a randomized control trial or any of that. And so that's where I think, you know, if you have an idea and you're building a new, a new way to deliver something that is known to work, or you can prove that it works, that's that's the focus. Nobody wants to pay, nobody wants the cost of healthcare to go up because of stuff that doesn't work. Patients don't want it, doctors don't want it. Well said. Yeah, and, and it and it brings up, and you sort of both invoke this sort of natural question, which is when is enough evidence enough? What is the right type of evidence? We're 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 entering all these new modalities of care and, and both the experience and the delivery is going to evolve as technology evolves. I mean, that's inescapable. So what is the right amount of evidence to make determinations that yes, this works, yes, it's showing a financial and a clinical impact. And thus we feel comfortable in both either the regulatory changes that may come or the payment changes that may come. So I'm interested in both of you all is how do you think through that? And how do you advise people to begin thinking about that as they're either on their digital health journey or they're trying to uh, a hospital health system who's trying to mobilize their virtual uh, care delivery systems. I'm going to let Zeke go first on that. So what the, yeah. what the AMA and the RUC and the DMPAG look at? Yeah, thank you. I know Lucia's, and I've, I've spoken to her you know, privately about this, but also in this type of webinars about some of the data that they've been able to acquire. But just from a CPT perspective, you know, we look at strength of evidence and we sort of, have, we actually, you know, imagine someone put forth an, an application for a new CPT code. I mean, what, there's a few questions that we ask early on in that application process before that gets forwarded along to the panel and forwarded along within the process. That's number one, you know, is there a coding gap? And this is a really important, you know, related to the points already made and Lucia's points in particular is, 
you know, if there's already a CPT code to describe that service, there's really no, by definition, need to, to create a new one. So assuming there is a coding gap, assuming the service is different than what exists, then as I mentioned earlier, we look at you know, FDA approval, and mo you know, most of what we see goes through the traditional FDA process. We have some that go through the de novo process. Some of the earliest artificial intelligence applications were de novo because they had no predicate device. And, and, and that was a separate discussion, which we would typically have at the panel. But even for the literature, you know, I said earlier, we want robust literature, but we rank the literature. You know, we have a scale whereby you know, we look at literature. You know, on the lesser end of that would be just case studies and descriptions. You know, it's sort of highest level of, of, of credibility for, for literature would be, you know, prospective, you know, randomized, you know, you know double-blinded type studies. And we look at the, the we, we prefer those to be United States literature and we prefer those to be within a large patient group. But again, this, you know, to Lucian Ryan, to, to our points that are made earlier is, you know, from an innovation cycle, we talk about widely used, well, I need to be able to report my service to get widely used. When we talk about being able to, to, to build out and perform these, these large scale clinical trials, not just for FDA approval, but for something like CPT and they're expensive and they're difficult and there's a lot of patients. And so, you know, we try to be mindful and respectful of that, but at the same time, you know, we have to be consistent in what those standards are to ensure that innovation reaches patient care as safely and responsibly as possible. And then just to add to that, uh, nobody should come away from this webinar thinking that everything that's virtual first care is subject to the FDA. OMADA does not build a device. We're not subject to the FDA. We're 100% a service, as are many other um, Digital Medicine Society impact members. So um, you have to understand enough about the CPT system uh, in C toolkit to understand category one, category two, category three. You've got to have the basics, which we're not going to cover today. But the second thing I was going to say is um, that uh, there also are standards for what constitutes good literature and uh, not to, uh, well, we're here at a dime thing. Dime has a great toolkit on that too, right? What we, the scientists know what constitutes good literature and the clinicians can tell when it's a made up measure or something that's not standard. Um, any of you who've ever pitched a health system for your service or a medical director within a payer, they're, they have a really good nose for that. That's what they're trained to do is to understand when they can look at the science and, and see it as reliable. So I would really urge people to stick to best practices because that the, the comparison is something else that's being measured against those best practices. And, and how do you all see both systems whether they're large integrated systems that have a, a payer embedded, whether they're sort of a rural hospital, whether they're a digital health company, I mean, what do you all see as sort of the practical and important uh, things that people need to be considering to prepare for this modality of care, which I think we've all agreed is it's here to stay in some form or fashion. But what are those big things that these, these entities and these systems need to be thinking about to really prepare for this becoming a part of the way that care is delivered and just a general sense? I guess I would say two things. I mean, I think it's really important for people who are going to pay for this care or contract for the care to be supplied to, to understand that the presence of software does not make it a SaaS product and the presence of software does not make it a SaaS vendor. And the analogy I would give is, you know, if you're a, a big system or you're a, more importantly, a big payer and you're contracting for a multi-site, multi-specialty medical group to be in your network, that group is going to use an EHR. They're going to use software throughout their workflow, but they're still a provider. And I think virtual first care organizations that are providing the kind of care that impact members are fall into that same bucket. So just wrap your mind around the fact that software doesn't equal SaaS, um, that providers, we want providers to be software enabled. That's why we spent almost $3 billion now of taxpayer money incenting um, the use of EHR. So that's that's kind of one thing. The second thing I would say is, um, you know, uh, every organization is unique and you have to have a service or a product that really is meets the needs of that population. For example, um, if you're a payer with a big rural population, you're in a state that where people live all over and there's not very much broadband, like South Dakota or Wyoming, you've got to have a service that works there. And so the, the, 
the virtual first providers need to understand the unique nature of each of their customers without creating obviously bespoke products. And then the last thing I'll say is, don't forget that even if a CPT code is uh, approved by the panel, it takes a while for it to be instantiated in the programming of the claims engines. So uh, our 0488T is a great example, it was approved in 2018, but it didn't really start getting widely used until 2019, 2020, because the claims processing engines have to be programmed to um, process it. And, and the RPM codes are a great example. They're programmed, but they automatically apply copay. So if you have an RPM-based business model, your patient is going to get a copay bill. Is that really what everyone wants out of that system? Yeah, and this is Zeke. I'm so glad to hear Lucia make that last point at the end because as we think about the, the sort of revenue cycle doesn't specifically necessarily apply, but people understand it. So I'll use the term is, and this will build on some of Don's comments from earlier is, you know, CPT, the ability to report a service and describe a service and account for a service is, is important. You know, what 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 the RUC does, what, what my committee does to determine relative value units and payment, I mean, that matters. That's relevant to business planning. But the piece that becomes particularly important is coverage, is what, what are, you know, if we're a practice, if we're a multi-specialty practice across multiple states or even in a single state, most of us have a you know, heterogeneous group of payers to whom we have to accommodate to whom we submit payments and to whom we, we, we hope for coverage. So at the AMA, we've, we've sort of looked at this. We recognize that this is a challenge. We recognize this is a circumstance. And so we've actually, I, I wish that it were ready to roll out today. It's actually gonna be ready to roll out around September 11th. And, and this is Stacy Lloyd and a really talented team at the AMA that have worked really hard on this research to look and create a, a document to sort of look at coverage, look at, payer issues, look at what they're providing. And the way it was done was looking at about 15 commercial payers and looking at RPM, RTM, e-visits, you know, e-consults, and put out an issue brief based on not just research or publicly available information, but also look at interviews. And I'd like, if I could, Ryan, just let me just highlight a couple of what I understand are the high level themes. But again, I'm going to defer to Stacey Lloyd and that team with the document that will be produced soon. But and this is not going to come as a surprise to many on this audience, but I think it's worth stating is that there's a pretty inconsistent adoption and sort of a lack of alignment between multiple payers. Think commercial payers, Medicare, even Medicaid at the state level. Um, it's not easy for physicians and patients to find not just what the codes are, but specifically what is covered and what's not. And to Lucia's important point, to better understand, you know, what's that payment responsibility for the patient? You know, what's the co-insurance? What's the copay? What's the deductible? And the last piece, as I understand it, is that sort of looking at, this is really important to Lucia's point is, you know, understanding what those timelines are is, is really, and oftentimes the proverbial black box, it's really hard for physicians and organizations that are doing business planning to look at a code like the one that Lucia provided, but even just a really standard CPT code and really try to understand when that's going to be integrated into the information systems, when it's going to be payable, and when I submit a claim to the payer. Um, I'm actually going to get paid for it because that's such a critical part of business planning. And it's really a critical part of making these services available to physicians and to patients. So we're going to save some time. I know there's, there's some questions that are open, but I, as we sort of round this out, I'm interested from each of you all and what do you all see as next? What are the next steps? What's on the horizon? What are the things we need to be thinking about? And what are the conversations we need to be having today to prepare for uh, tomorrow? Um, I'll, I'll take a start on that. I mentioned before that, that we kind of want to um, have a conversation with the AMA and other coding establishers. There's drug codes and CMS and all that kind of stuff um, about what does it cost to deliver clinically effective care in a virtual first setting, right? We don't have a nurse or a receptionist sitting at the front desk taking a photocopy of your driver's license. We authenticate our patients in a different way, right? We have a software stack that has complicated layers of different kinds of software we use, 
all connected through, you know, a cloud-based program, whatever, like that. We have a different infrastructure than an in 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 person practice, but it's an important infrastructure for delivery nonetheless. What does that look like? So that's one conversation and the capabilities of that infrastructure. The second conversation that I'm really interested in having, but it may be that I'm impatient, is I want to talk about time. I think time is an okay proxy for effort and acuity, but I think that we need to think about time through the lens of this audit log and through the lens of the fact that a, a very, very sophisticated and highly trained physician all the way down to you know, a health coach can provide legitimate and health, and health improving care um, through effort that happens over many days, asynchronous care. And I, I wanna have that conversation. Yeah, and this is, I'm so glad time was mentioned because, you know, time is often used as a proxy for payment and for work and performance and productivity. And, and it, if you think about it, it's kind of obvious. I mean, we all know what generally time is. I mean, 10 minutes is 10 minutes, et cetera. But there's so many other parameters that go into to what professionals do. And, and we talk about it, the RUC intensity, you know, a very, a very complex patient in a very challenging circumstance is just more intense than a younger patient that you know, is being pre-opt and is otherwise healthy. So we try to find ways to allow the intensity to inform a higher evaluation and to do so in a way that not just provides reimbursement to the physician that's taking care of those sicker patients, but I think very importantly, doesn't disincentivize phys physicians for taking care of the most vulnerable and the most needy patients. And you know, at the AMA, we're sort of keenly aware of that. Um, to your question, Ryan, as far as sort of what next steps is. You know, my sort of comment on this, and, and again, I know I predict there's a number of innovators that are on this call listening, and I've already mentioned that word several times. I, it's important to understand that much of what we talk about in the current day is based on laws and regulations that go back decades. I mean, Lucia knows those as well as anyone in the country. And and, and the challenge that that creates is we can't necessarily, as much as we might want to, and as much as we may think it's the right thing to do, we can't just flip a switch and change definitions. We can't just flip a switch and change payment systems. We can't just flip a switch. We have to work within the existing systems. And I know that sounds bureaucratic, and I know that sounds like a dinosaur, and I don't mean for it to. I just, it's just, I, I just, I want to, my, my point is just, let, let's continue to innovate. Let's continue to base what we're doing and what we see in our personal experience. And let's just accept that, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint, and that we're gonna to continue to work as hard as we can to inform policymakers that those laws and regulations can change in a way that's in the best interest of patient care. And yeah, just as an ex-Fed, I would say, you know, that has to start with collaborative, small conversations, right? Like this, is, you don't change. Yes, you can throw money at Congress and definitely something will happen eventually and it could be many years. But the educating of people is the more important step. Um, and and I think that we're on the road to that. And uh, I think people who want to join in that activity should contact the DIME team about what we'll be doing next. Great point, so important. Yeah, well, and and a question specific to, to Zeke and Lucia, which you just both mentioned was, you know, would you advise innovators to apply for a new category three code for their technology or use an existing one? Yeah, this, I mean, I, I like category three codes. I mean, they're by definition for emerging technologies that perhaps aren't as widely used or, or the literature isn't as strong and the FDA support is different. So yeah, I think it's a very good way to allow those services to be described, to build experience, to build outcomes data, and to build resource data as well. And I think it's fair to say just because it's a category three code does not necessarily mean it's not going to be paid. I mean, there are coverage determinations which are and can be favorable to provide coverage for a category three service, particularly if it's one that's extremely innovative and extremely obviously beneficial. Now, the Cures Act changed a lot of that. We don't see as many local coverage determinations, which are at the state level. We're, we're seeing more of an evolution towards national coverage determinations, which are by definition more difficult to achieve, but it's still possible. Just, just to add on that, I don't disagree, but I also want to uh, 
from experience, I can say that you can have a code and a, a particular private carrier might not cover that condition. RPMs are a great example. The coverage for RPMs is quite mixed because some pairs don't see it as um, improving utilization. In fact, they see, see it as quite the opposite. And so if you're interested in that, you need to kind of become a student on how do private payers make coverage decisions, which is different than how Medicare makes coverage decisions. Of course, what Medicare does influences private payers sort of, but sometimes private payers are ahead of Medicare and sometimes private payers are far behind because they're less susceptible to political pressure. Awesome. Yeah, it's great points. One of the questions that came in was really from an individual who's worked with these virtual first care organizations and interviewing providers and the barriers around adopting uh, new remote patient monitoring or sort of the implementation of these codes. And you know, they note that the hesitation uh, and then sort of the lack of maybe awareness comes from management, not, you know, the, the an inability to try new things sometimes. So from both of your perspectives, how do you see new payment structures being created and adopted uh, in a way that sort of overcomes that initial uh, gap of inertia? I mean, I certainly think invoices and PMPMs, which were kind of are out of fashion now, but were an early stage for virtual first companies as kind of like um, fallback positions, but I don't think they're helpful for uh, the new modality of care proving itself for reasons we've talked about. And I don't think they're helpful for the payer to understand if their money is being well spent. Yeah, I mean, and there are, I, I'm just glanced at one of the questions, you know, sort of looking like the NTAP payment for, you know, DRGs. I mean, that was one of the artificial intelligence applications for large vessel occlusions that went through that process. And I think those are avenues that that, that I think it's completely reasonable to, to, to pursue for innovators. Uh, I say that in parallel to working through more traditional regulatory processes and CPT codes. But, but, but to, your, to your question, Ryan, yeah, it's, it's a matter of finding a way to, to, to bring that, that device to patient care to show it the benefits, but also to find a way to achieve some degree of reimbursement to support continued growth. Yeah, and look, this has been an amazing conversation. I know that we could go on and on and on. We haven't even touched upon the regulations around the components of the technologies that are emerging. Um, but as we sort of close out, I really wanted to give a chance both to, to Lucia and Zeke to provide just some final comments, thoughts, uh, and considerations. Uh, you both play an important role in this space and both provide just a wealth of knowledge and, and your a willingness to be available, both to myself and to the attendings, I think is incredibly appreciated. So Lucia, any, any final closing comments, thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, I, I'm really glad we did this work this year. I think this is a great touch point for the public about what the work has been. But what I'm really looking forward to is now that we kind of all have the same baseline understanding, what are you know the top three things we can spend the next year working on together? I'm very excited to see the AMA report that's coming out um, on the 11th. And I'm going to the webinar tomorrow. I saw that somebody put that in the chat. So uh, you can just Google AMA virtual care and literally the registration will pop right up. Um, and I think that that will be a great opportunity for people to get some additional background from experts. And, and I'll sort of build on you know, some comments Lucia made earlier, and that is just how important collaboration, how, how important teamwork is in this broader effort. I mean, I've always I've always said, if, if your goal, and, and, and I say this in the most sincere sense possible, if your goal is really to do what's best for patients, then the rest of it sort of becomes easy and takes care of itself. And, and I, I'm going to use an example, if I could really quickly, was you know, when we saw the first product come out, one of the first to go through the de novo process for a machine learning algorithm to inform care in a completely autonomous manner, it was for diabetic retinopathy. And Michael Abernoff is the, is the president. He was the founder, really a developer of that. And I remember an early conversation that I, that I had with Michael, and we were talking about how we could, things that he could do from a regulatory perspective to bring this to patient care. And I could just see in his eyes and see in his perspective that you know, he was thinking about all of those things from a practical sense. But what he was really thinking was you know, he knew that this product could make a difference. He knew how important this could be for public health. He knew this was a vulnerable population, think pre-diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. And he knew how important vision was to sort of overall function. So for him, it was just a calling because he believed in the product. And I know the audience and I know those on this panel, you know, we, we believe in what we do and what we bring to patient care. And ideally in the perfect world, that would make this relatively easy to achieve. 
Well, amazing discussion. Appreciate, again, both of your time and your willingness. Uh, and Abby, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you to our panelists for an excellent discussion and really thought-provoking questions to consider as we continue to think about how to integrate virtual first care and really move the entire healthcare ecosystem forward. As everyone mentioned, it's not just about billing and payment. CPT has so many applications touching policymaking, resource tracking, and moving further into value-based care. Zeke and Lucia both mentioned continued collaboration, and we really look forward to the opportunity to continue to work towards these things together. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the Payment Encoding Toolkit is now available on our website. There's also a variety of other tools that can be used alongside these resources, including core competencies, contracting, and care transitions. Katie dropped a link for more information on how to get involved with IMPACT, and we would love to hear your thoughts or answer any questions you might have about the resources or community. Thank you for joining us today, and stay tuned for more events and speakers from DIME and IMPACT, including the V1C Pavilion at this year's health conference coming up in just a few short weeks. A huge thank you again to our panelists and to everyone for attending, and we look forward to hosting you for another event soon.